Hi guys, it is unit four, sequences in series, which is a topic that you saw back in Algebra 1. And we're going to take it kind of from where you know it there and extend it beyond. So on the first page, you'll see this fun little notation, this guy that looks sort of like a capital E, that is called sigma. So this is something that we'll learn, I think it's on day four of the unit, but I thought I'd just mention it there because I found that nice little um, graphic to go with it. All right, on the next page, really quick, a rundown of what's coming. So you're going to be watching the video for day one tonight, just recognizing the notation. And then in class, um, we'll go over some of the homework, some of the challenges that go along with it. There are arithmetic sequences, geometric sequences. There's that day four, that summation I was just talking about. And then we'll talk about what is a series versus a sequence. We have a practice day. And then these formulas on day eight are intense. Uh, nothing to memorize, just have to know how to use them, all right? And then we'll review and test. So let's dive right on in to the first day. I'm going to zoom in just a touch, so hopefully you can see everything okay. Whoops, there we go. All right, so intro to sequences. The first thing that we want to understand is, all right, well, what even is a sequence? So all a sequence is is an ordered list of numbers, which typically then have a pattern. And those are the ones that we're really going to be looking at is how do we find the pattern? How do we figure out what is the 10th number in the sequence or the 50th number and so on? So the first part says, let's look at a really famous sequence called the Fibonacci sequence. So uh, if any of you have read like the Da Vinci Code, which is a book by Dan Brown, and they made a movie out of it. Uh, they reference the Fibonacci sequence in there, and it starts with zero. It goes zero, one, one, two, three, five, and so on. Okay. So it says, can you figure out the pattern? This is a really tricky little pattern. So if you don't have a lot of time to look at it, it might be tough to find. So feel free to pause and take a look first. But what the pattern is for this particular one is if you add together any two terms, it produces the next term. So zero plus one gives you that one. And then one and one, that'll give you the two here and so on. So if you go further out into the list, you know, two plus three, that'll give you five. Five plus eight, um, that would turn into 13 and so on. All right. So the rule is that you can add two terms together to get the next term. And so when I say term, I'm talking about like the number. So I can add those two numbers together, it gives me the next number. And then I can add these two together, it gives me the next number and so on. So when it says, can you figure out the next few numbers? Well, yeah, we definitely should be able to. You might need your calculator, right? So if the list kind of ends here at 2134, to get that next number, we'd be adding those together. So if we add together 21 plus 34, that's going to give us 55. And so then you can add 55 to the list here. And then if it asks you for the next one, we'd be doing 34 and 55 to get that next value. So 34 and 55, and we'd get 89. And it would keep on going just like that, right? So when it says, can you write a formula to get any value of the sequence? Yes, we definitely can. We're not going to do that just yet. All right. So yes, I'm going to say, but not yet. We'll put a little smiley. We'll come back to that guy. Okay. So as we slide down today, since we are trying to recall all this from Algebra 1, let's talk about all the notations that you've probably seen, but it's been a while. So the first thing here, the notation can be written in two different ways. There's sequence notation. I'm not going to fib. This is what my brain tends to gravitate towards. But you can use function notation. So in the sequence notation, you have the little subscript. So you would read this as A sub N. All right. That's how you literally read that is A sub N. All right. Um, and then it represents when it says the nth term in the sequence, you got to think about filling in a number for n. So maybe if it's a sub three, that would be the third term in the sequence. All right. So as an example, you know, a 
sub, maybe let's use a list above. If I said, what's a sub five, all right? If I come back up here, the fifth term in the sequence, so one, two, three, four, five, was a three. So a sub five is equal, whoops, to three, which literally means that three is the fifth number in the list. So sometimes it just helps to see like a little example like that to understand it better. Right? So that's why we say n is the position number. So that sub five was meaning it's the fifth number in the list. Um, if you want to write the same thing in function notation, instead of doing a sub n, you would just write it as a of n or f of n, right? And n would represent the same thing. So down here in the chart, it gets a little repetitive, but to give you an idea. So if the term in the sequence is one, then we would write that as a sub one in sequence notation or a of one in function notation. And then you could say the second term would then be a sub two or a of two and so on, all right? What you're gonna see though, whoops, is that when we use this generic notation, you have to write really neatly to make sure that you can see that it's in the subscript. So a sub n minus one, and a sub n, a sub n plus one, all right? So I can give you any old number I want, but what the heck does all this mean? Well, when we use a sub n, this is typically what we'll do, talk about to talk about any like term that could be anywhere in the sequence. So then when I say a sub n minus one, this is simply just the term before a sub n, all right? So this will be the term before a sub n, all right? And then a sub n plus one or a of n plus one, that would simply just be the term after this guy. Mm -hmm. And that's important to note um, because of the idea that we're going to be talking about something called recursive sequences. And you often have to use the term before in the list to get the next number. And so that's why it's helpful to have this notation here. Right? And then that last one would just be a of 50. Okay. So two key things that we're going to talk about today are explicit formula and recursive formula. So I just mentioned recursive a second ago. Let's get explicit down first though. So an explicit formula, it's a rule that gives the pattern based on the value of n. So let's write that down first. A rule that gives the pattern based on the value, kind of box that in from above, the value of n. All right. So a rule that gives the pattern based on the value of n. If I give you an example, it'll be a little easier to think about. So if I want to find the 20th term, all right, so to find the 20th term, this rule or equation essentially, I would just be able to plug in n equals 20 and it'll kick out the answer. So I would say we would plug in n equals 20 to get the answer. Right, so often it might look like almost like a y equals mx plus b equation or something like that. You would just plug in the number, kick out what you want, right? Whereas a recursive formula, that's a little bit different. A recursive rule, I always think of this like a scavenger hunt, right? Um, you need to find one thing to be able to get the next to get the next, right? So it is a rule that gives the pattern... based on the previous term. And you can say term or terms because like the Fibonacci sequence above, you needed the two terms before it to be able to figure out the next value, all right? So in this case, to find the 20th term, It's not that you'd have an equation really to plug into, it's to just plug 20 into, I should say. You need to know what the 19th term was, and then you'd be able to figure out like what to do with that to get the 20th term, all right? So I'm gonna say to find the 20th term, you need 
the term before it, i.e. the 19th term, all right? That's what you really need. So with that being said, you always have to have a number to start with. So to be able to have a recursive formula, you must be given a value to start with. which means they typically will hand you a one and say like, hey, the first term is seven. All right, now go from there, all right? Whereas with an explicit formula, they don't need to give you the first term because you have an equation to plug into. Okay. All right, with that being said, let's see some of these in action so you understand what I'm saying here. As always, feel free to pause the video anytime you need to if I'm moving faster than you were able to write or if you need to hear something again. All right. So this first one, um, sequence is using explicit formulas. So we actually have a rule that we can plug into. So the first one is just saying a sequence is defined by a of n equals 2n minus 1. So it's like a little linear equation. All right. This also, just good to know, would be the same as saying a sub n equals 2n minus 1. Those would be interchangeable right there. All right. So the first three terms of the sequence, when it says denoted by a of 1, a of 2, and a of 3, really just means let's plug in n equaling 1, 2, and 3 into the little equation that you're given. So a of 1 means I'm going to do 2 times 1 minus 1. So there's my first term right here. All right? When I plug in a 2, 2 times 2 minus 1, that's going to kick out a value of 3. So that's my second term. And then a sub, or excuse me, a of 3. Um, when I plug in a 3 here, that's going to kick out five. That's my third term. So if I wrote this out as a list, it would be one, then three, then five, and it could keep on going. All right. So that means this is the first term. That is the second term. That's the third term. So you could think of this as a sub one, a sub two, and a sub three, or a of one, a of two, and a of three. Those are synonymous. Okay. When it says which term has a value of 53, well, they're saying somewhere down the line, there's a 53 on that list and they want to know what value. So is it the 10th term? Is it the 20th? So what term placeholder there is it? All right. So a sub n or a of n is going to be equal to 53. What n value will do it? Well, we can actually just put this into the equation in place of the a of n part of it. So if I put 53 on the left and then 2n minus 1, we can quick solve it by adding 1 over. And then we get 2n equals 54. When we divide by 2, n would be equal to, whoops, not 57. Oh, geez. n would be equal to 27. Mm -hmm. Let me wipe that out and fix that. All right. So that, that means is way down the list, this would be the 27th number on that list right there. Right? Now, could you have just continued the pattern and then counted until you got to 53? Sure, but you're also not in like the third grade. So we want to try to take an algebraic approach to being able to solve these questions. Right? If you find that you're like, man, I'm out of luck. Yes. Could you always use that as a backup? Sure. Otherwise, I expect you to solve these algebraically. So we would say that the 27th term is 53. That's what we'd be looking for here. All right. Part C, explain why there will not be a term that has a value of 70. Well, if you look at the numbers, it's going 1, 3, 5, and so on. They're all odd. This is even. So you could just simply use the argument that all the terms in the list are odd numbers, and this is an even number, or you could actually set 70 equal to 2n minus 1 and solve for it, just like we did last time. This would give you 71. When you go to divide it by 2, n would come out to be 35.5, but you have to remember what n standing for. It's a term number. There is no 35 and a half term. You know, this isn't like Harry Potter or something, so it, it, this doesn't make any sense, so we would toss it out. Right. So n excuse me, needs to always be equal to whole numbers since it's representing a term um, in the list itself. Right? So anything along the lines of that number is not odd. This is not coming out the way you want it to. Lots of ways you can explain it. 
All right. For example, too, we have a different explicit formula. It's just saying, let's let a sub n be equal to, to the n power. Find the first three terms. All right. So just quick practice plugging in. So you're again going to plug in one, two, and three. So that means a sub one would be two to the first power or two. A sub two is two to the second power, which is four. A sub three is two to the third power, which would be eight. So there's your first three values. And it would keep going, but that's all they're asking you for. So easy, using the formula, plug it in. All right, for the next one, now we're looking at recursive formulas. So instead of having a rule where I can just plug n in like the last one, this time you have to use the term before it. So when it says a sequence is described as f of n is equal to f of n minus one and then plus five, and they're telling you that the first term is negative two, that's where I have to start, right? So something I want you to keep in mind, when I think of the rule as being f of n equals f of n minus one plus five, this notation, that represents the term before f of n. So it's really just saying, can you take the previous term and then add five to it? If you can think of it that way, it makes it fairly simple to work with this one. So the very first term that they tell us, which is f of one, is negative two. And then it asks you to find the first five numbers. So that means to solve for the second term or find f of two, keep in mind I'm putting a two there for n. So when I do f of two minus one, I'm really saying, take f of one, which is the term before f of two, and now add five to it, all right? Well, the first term was negative two, so that's a negative two, add five, and we get three. So all we really did was take this guy, add five, bam, there's your answer, all right? And then you could do that again. So if I wanna find the third term, if I wanna kind of use the, the rule, I could say, all right, I'm gonna put a three in here, so I'm gonna put three right there. So it's f of three minus one plus five, which really means take f of two and add five. Well, f of two is just a fancy way of saying, take the second term, because this is f of two right here, and add five to it. So it becomes three plus five or eight. So if you can understand what the recursive rule is saying, just take the term before it and add five, you don't necessarily have to show me all of this. I just wanted you to see it a few times so that you could wrap your head around it. Otherwise, to get the fourth term, take the term before it, so that's eight, add five to it, this will be 13. And now to get the fifth term, take the term before it, the 13, add five, you'd get 18, and there you go. So recursive formula can be very simple, but sometimes reading the notation is where it gets a little bit tough. So when it asks you to find the 10th term, um, you can, of course, continue the list, or what I'd want you to think about is how many times did you add 5 to negative 2 to get from, let's say, the first term up to the 10th term? So the first term was negative 2. We'd have to add on how many 5s to get up to this 10th term, All right? Well, since you add on one five to get to the second term and another five to get to the third term, basically you would have to add on not 10 fives, but nine of them. So I'd have to add on five, nine times here, or I can just show it as nine times five like that to equal the 10th term. So let's see if we do some mental math here, that's 45, add that to a negative two, that 10th term should be 43. Right. And if you took the time to come back here and just extend that list, you would see that the 10th term there ends up being 43. Now, the idea that we're looking at this kind of concept, we're going to make it more formal in the day two notes. So for right now, I just want you to kind of think about like, all right, cool, I can follow the idea that we add on five, nine times over. But don't feel like you have to be able to create your own magical equation with it. I just want you to think about it. All right, we have a couple more I want to look at together, and then we're going to leave some for a recap in class. So on to the next page. Um, when you look at example four here, it says given the sequence, erase it, there you go. Um, it's asking what's the pattern? So to go from four to seven to 10 to 13 to 16, 
right now in your head, you should be going, mm, that's plus three and plus three and plus three. So we add three. How could you determine the next three terms? Well, just keep adding three. And so if we get the next three terms, let's see, if we add three to 16, that'd be 19 plus three, that'd give us 22 and then 25 and it would keep going. Right? Now, for those of you that are like, I could just keep extending the pattern. It's kind of annoying when I ask you for something like the hundredth term, because you'd be sitting here for a while. So what I'd really want you to think of is kind of what did we do on that last one? Well, to go from the first term, so a sub one or a of one, however you prefer to write it, to the 100th term, I want you to think about how many times would you have to add three on to get up to the 100th term? So technically, how many of these guys would there be to get all the way to whatever the heck this value is right here? So to go from the first term out to the 100th term, Think about it, that's a difference of 99 numbers in between there. You'd have to add on 99 threes right here. So really, it'd be four plus 99 times three, and then equals whatever the heck that's gonna give you. All right, well, let's quick calculate. If we do 99 times three, we're gonna add 297 onto four, so add that onto four, that's gonna bring us up to 301. So if you're super bored and you have nothing else to do, sure, you can keep playing extend that pattern and see if that's where you land. Otherwise, I promise you, yeah, that's where it should land is our answer there. All right, we're going to do one last one together and then save the last two for class. So it says write out the first five terms of the sequence here. Notice the notation that you're giving you. Um, you're given a sub n plus 1 equals 2 times a sub n minus 3. And then they're telling you the first term is 2. Anytime you're given the first term, that's how you spot that this is a recursive sequence, right? So I can't just plug n in and calculate a number. I have to think about it as being the term before it. So in this case, that means my rule is to find the n plus 1th term. I'm going to double the a sub nth term and then subtract 3 from it. Okay. So over here, I know it says let's find the first five terms. Maybe we'll just do the first four terms. All right, the first term itself is two. So that's your first little term. Okay. Now the notation is a little different this time. But if I go back to that first page for a second, I'm going to slide it back underneath here. They're using a sub n plus one and then a sub n. This is still just the term before that guy. So that's all it's saying is to find this term plug in the term before it, and then go from there. So if you can think of this as really saying two times the term, or the previous term might be a nicer way to say that. You can say term before it too, right? The previous term, and then subtract three. Okay. So to do this, to find the second term, we would have to do two times the term before the second term, which is the first term, and then subtract three. All right, well, first term was two, so plug a two in here, and then calculate. Two times two would be four minus three, that's gonna be plain old one. So that's my second term there. All right, let's look for the third term. All right, to get the third term, you're gonna do two times the term that comes before it, so that's a sub 2, and then minus 3. All right, the second term, well, that was 1 right here. 2 minus 3, that'll give me negative 1. So there's my third term. And then you can do that one more time. So a sub 4, you're going to do 2 times the term before it. So 2 times a sub 3, and then subtract 3. Third term was a negative 1. And then when we calculate, oops, I'm almost off the page there, um, negative 2 minus 3, that'll give us negative 5, and that can go here. Okay? So if you can at least spot, all right, it's explicit, then I'm just plugging in, and if I want the 10th term, you plug a 10 in, and it kicks out whatever the answer is. 
if they hand you the first term and you see something like a sub n or a sub n minus one within the little rule, then you know, hey, this is recursive. If I want the 10th term, I would have to find the ninth term. And to get the ninth term, I would have needed the eighth term and so on, all right? So example six, write yourself a little note. We're gonna save that for our recap. And then there's one last thing on the last page. We will get to that guy um, in class as well. Thanks, guys. Have a good rest of your day.